the Midwest United States is known as the breadbasket of America, producing the bulk of our wheat, as well as a number of other food staples. But food is not the only thing the Midwest produces, unless you're talking about the people. Because the Midwest harbors loads of unique and terrifying monsters. Some of you you may have heard of, others you might not have but all of them are beings you don't want to find yourself face to face with, day or night. So let's give a big good luck to Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, Ohio, and Wisconsin, because that's where these allegedly real monster sightings come from. If you've got a story you'd like to share, you can send it to us at darknessprevails.org. The Field Stalker, from Names James 0933, location, Michigan. This happened in 2002. I'm a bit of a loner, and at the time I spent most of my days hunting, fishing, or working as a freelance carpenter handyman for the neighboring towns. I lived in a wooden cabin that I built on a small amount of land I owned, it was located not too far from Lake Huron. I always craved isolation and had the perfect setup for it. People never bothered me unless they had inquiries about fixing up their house or crafting a piece of furniture. I had everything the way I wanted it to be, but something decided to inhabit my land that would mark the end of my days of solitude. I remember it being a particularly cold and snowy December day when I first saw it. Huge powdery flakes floated down to my roof with light thumps as I sat around the fireplace, warmth coating me while I cooked up some rabbit stew. As I reached into the cauldron to pour some of the stew into my bowl, I heard a loud shriek coming from outside the cabin. It was so loud and abrupt that I dropped the scalding hot bowl onto my legs in the floor. I yelled out a curse as the bowl shattered. I picked myself up aggravated now, and I swung open the door to find whatever it was that screwed up my dinner. The snow was falling heavily as I patrolled around my cabin. My footsteps crunched loudly into the white ground as I searched the surrounding area, but I could not seem to locate the source of that noise. The bitter cold was starting to constrict my movement as the small amount of adrenaline that I had was beginning to wear off now. It must have been 10 degrees below, so I turned back to my cabin, but it was then that I saw what must have made that shriek. On the opposite side of the cabin, I saw an animal lying in the blinding white sheet, and I thought it must have been a large raccoon or groundhog. I trudged my way through the snow towards it, but as I got closer, I saw that it was something else. A mostly eaten deer lay on the ground, as fresh red was still seeping out of its shredded stomach and throat. Its legs were gone, and pretty much all that remained was a head attached to a mangled torso, fear still present in its glossy eyes. My mind immediately shifted to bear, but even a bear couldn't have done this much damage so quickly. Wolves, maybe, I thought. It was right then that I noticed a set of tracks that led up to the remains. Not those of a wolf or a bear. They looked almost human. However, one of the recurring prints was noticeably bigger than the other. I stepped back, and I began to back away from the deer. As I turned my head, I noticed a similar set of tracks through the huge falling snowflakes that led into the nearby forest. I followed them, but I began to feel uneasy as I approached the tree line. The snow was falling heavier by the second, and it was starting to become difficult to see at all. I thought I saw a flash of something race by me, about 30 feet to my right, but I didn't hear any sound. I made my way over to where I saw the movement, and I felt anxiety flood over me as I saw the same set of tracks now leading toward my cabin. 
I quickly shifted my gaze to the cabin, and in between the falling snowflakes, I could see a figure standing beside the house. Hello, I yelled out. You're on private property. I'd get going now if you don't want any trouble. I began to jog towards it. As I approached it, something seemed wrong. It didn't look like a person. Its skin was whiter than the snow around it, and it had an unnatural figure that twitched and writhed in front of me. I lost my focus as I gazed upon it, and I tripped in the deep snow. Quickly, I picked myself up and wiped the frost from my face. I saw it sprinting off into the distance, well over 100 yards away now. I stood up and took aim as I had brought my rifle with me, but it moved faster than any living thing I had ever seen. Before I knew it, it was completely out of sight. I quickly raced inside and barred the door shut, and I sat there for a while. What did I just see? I thought to myself. A few weeks passed by, and I sat up late wondering if that thing was going to show itself once more. I didn't know what it was, but curiosity was starting to nag at me as I spent my days sitting on the porch, scanning, watching, observing my land to find that thing. Time dragged on, and I was beginning to run low on food as I hadn't gone hunting in some time after seeing that creature near my cabin. But I had to eat, and I didn't like venturing into town for food. No, I liked my food fresh. I bundled up, and I made my way into the forest to get some fresh meat that could sustain me for a while. I walked through the snow, scanning the area nervously as paranoia gripped me tightly. I was almost to my tree stand that I had used to acquire much of my food. I swung my rifle around my back, and I made my way up the tree, looking every which way as I did so. I settled into the stand, and I zipped up my coat as the harsh Michigan winter roared through the forest. I was able to bag a few rabbits and squirrels, and it was turning into a pretty good day as I saw it. I had gotten enough food for the next few days. As I was about to call it a day, I was packing up, when I heard something walking through the snow a good distance away. I quickly leaned up on the edge of the stand, and I looked out to see a huge buck walking by. A buck this size would last me a good amount of time throughout the winter, and I actually felt myself salivating. I positioned my rifle to take down the beast. As my finger caressed the trigger, I was readying myself, but as I did... I saw a familiar flash go by, and the buck went with it. My ears were still ringing from when I fired. I looked out to see a horrible sight. I missed, and that thing had taken the deer down to the ground and was tearing it apart. It was so quick and efficient that the buck was alive for most of it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I watched as the buck's life slipped away, and the creature seemed to bathe in the viscera. It seemed more like a glutton than something that was starving. Not thinking, I pulled my rifle back up, and, hands trembling, I fired again. Whatever it was, I hit it, because the thing reared up, red all over its face. I had gotten its attention, but I don't think I heard it. It just sat there for a moment. I began to reload, but as I did, the thing shifted its gaze right at me. I finally got a good look at it. It was no longer shrouded by falling snow. It was disgusting. Limbs painfully hung off of its body. It only had one arm dangling off of it. It turned right back to its meal, continuing to feast. I took aim again and I got another direct hit to the head. This time it stood up, appearing agitated, but not at all hurt. With its singular arm, it scooped up the buck 
and flung it my way before it smashed into the old wood supporting me in the tree. Warm fluid splattered my face and I tried to center myself. Adrenaline was coursing through me as I tried to reload. As I did, I saw that thing bolting towards me. It was going again at that unnatural speed, all without a sound. I realized then that that buck couldn't have seen his own demise coming, even if he tried. As I'm trying to reload, I heard the thing hit the tree hard, and now I hear something crawling up the steps. Holding my breath, and now almost entirely on my back, I took aim at the top step, waiting for it. The moment I saw those massive teeth, that pale face, and a singular green eye on the left side, I unloaded on it. Gray patchy hair with bits of blonde flew back as I actually managed to hurt the creature, but it caught itself on the last few steps. It was hurt now, but I don't think it was much more than a scratch to it. Before I could pick myself back up, it was at the top step again, grabbing at my legs. Suddenly, my vision was obstructed. Its only arm had grabbed me by the top of my head, covering my vision with its palm, before sending my forehead flying into its body. I hit something hard. I think it was its skull, before it tossed me back down onto the tree stand. I was dizzy. My head felt like it was going to burst. I got one more blurry look at its face as it glared down at me with that one green eye. The eye held a great fear inside of it that didn't quite match the predatory look shown in its toothy smile. Maybe I did make it scared of me. Maybe it was scared of my rifle, or at least wary of it. Whatever I did, it was enough, and even though it had me where it wanted me, it instead jumped down and ran off into the forest without a sound. I somehow managed to get myself out of that tree stand. No doubt I had a concussion. I stumbled back to my cabin, picked up my phone and dialed an ambulance before blacking out on the floor. I woke up in the hospital, and though I survived the attack, I've never been able to overcome the mental damage brought on by these events. My family members don't believe my story, and I wouldn't blame them. I left my property and I've made sure that I'm constantly surrounded by family and people. I wanted to be so far away from that creature that all it was to me anymore was just a story. But every white flash of snow takes me back to that tree stand where that thing nearly ended my life. Skinwalker from Wendigo 6666. Location, Michigan. This happened when I was about 12 or 13 years old. I lived in southern Michigan, and a lot of strange things happened in those woods. My dad and I volunteered back then for a bird banding station. Bird banding is where a researcher catches a bird and puts a tiny numbered band on its leg to study its migration patterns. We're very careful not to hurt the birds, so we set up mist nets to catch them, rather than traditional traps. They were always released in the end, too. The land we banded on was owned by the head researcher named R. R's property was massive, with forests, marshlands, countryside, you name it. I loved to explore it while the banders were tagging birds. However, something happened there that made me cautious when out in the woods alone. It was a slow summer morning, and as I was walking through the forest enjoying the day, I suddenly hear this wailing sound. It sounded like a distressed deer or cat, or maybe both. Being the big animal lover that I was, I went looking for the wounded animal. It wasn't long before I came to the edge of the property, but something was wrong. The noise sounded further away than it did before, though I was certain that I had moved towards it. 
The woods around me were also completely silent, like something had obviously spooked the wildlife. I happened to look to my left to see a hunter's blind. Once I drew closer, I noticed something bizarre. The blind had been badly torn on the sides. It was as if someone sliced into it or out of it. Then I hear the same distant wailing sound again, so I did something dumb. I tried to mimic the noise as best I could right back at the thing. I was hoping that whatever it was would reveal itself to me. About five minutes later, I heard this low growling noise. It was coming from 20 yards to my left. Even after wandering the woods for most of my life, I've never heard a sound quite like that before. I knew that I had to get away from it. I made a run for R's house, and it wasn't long before I came to his yard, and I stopped to catch my breath. But suddenly, I hear the same low growl only 10 yards away now. It's coming from the bushes close to me, and when I turn and look, I see, of all things, a deer looking at me and growling. There was something off about that deer. Its eyes didn't look like a deer's either. I was so terrified that I immediately ran to find R, who was in a nearby research shed. I told him about this deer that had growled at me like some sort of big cat or dog. He was a very scientific guy after all. I thought he'd either disbelieve me or teach me something that I just didn't know. But at the back of my mind, I knew that this was no deer. I believed that whatever it was, was making that first noise to lure me off the property, which it did successfully. I only barely managed to make it out of there. I also learned a few years later that what I may have encountered was a skinwalker, an entity that can mimic animal and human voices to lure people to their demise. That could have been me. I could have been its next victim. I'd do anything for her. From Alex. Location, Wisconsin. This happened a year ago on my 16th birthday. My mom and I went to go visit my grandparents in Wisconsin. We go there every year to see my grandparents and of course my friend Marley and my horse Penelope. Marley sat in my grandparents' garage to surprise me when I got there, even though she does that every year. We pull into their driveway at about 11.30 p.m. After a five-hour drive of listening to my mother's god-awful music choices, I'm pretty tired. Marley runs around the car and wraps me in her arms, saying, I missed you, little bro. And I reply with, You too, little sis. That's how we referred to each other for as long as I could remember. She was born only a month before me, but she's a small girl, about five foot one, and I was six foot one by then, so we called each other Little. She started telling me all about what we had planned to do for the whole week, but I block her out and just nod my head with the occasional cool. She eventually realizes that I'm just exhausted and asks me to drive her home real quick. Fast forward to the next day. My mom has taken my grandma to see my great-grandma in the hospital, and my grandfather was out drinking with his friends. Me and Marley are home alone, and we're trusted to be alone together as we've been friends since diapers. We haven't been known to get in trouble together. Well, at least not get caught. She suddenly says to me, You want to go on an adventure? I think, what is she talking about? And reply with, Sure. Usually, when she's talking about adventure, we end up having a really good time, even if it's a bit random. She goes to the bathroom before we go, and just in case, I slip my grandpa's twenty-two into my string bag, and I wait outside for her. She comes out, and we jump onto the four-wheeler and head off. It's about ten at night, but this is a country area, so there's no houses around for a couple of miles. 
We start down the road and she tells me to pull off on a dirt path. When we get to our destination, there's a fire pit there. We kindle the fire and make some fire roast marshmallows, telling each other ghost stories for about 20 minutes. It's then that out of nowhere, we hear this wail of pure agony. Immediately, we jump up and look off in the direction where the sound is coming from. We can see what's making the sound, and it appears to be a dog. It's walking like all its legs are broken. I immediately assume it's a dog that's been hit by a car. I call to it. Hey, you okay? That's when this dog stands up on its two hind legs, then screams again. Its upper body resembled more of a wolf, but it's definitely no poor dog or wolf at all. It's not hurt either. It's just some seven-foot abomination. I yell to Marley to run. She doesn't hesitate, jumping on the four-wheeler and starting it. I jump on behind her. She kicks it into full speed, going down the trail. Soon, we whip out onto the main road. But the creature that we saw, with its disgustingly bent legs, it's behind us, easily catching up with us. I can hear the clack of its claws on the pavement. I know that we can't let it follow us home, and I know that we need to go faster. I tell Marley not to look back no matter what. I know how crazy this is, but I can only think of my family, my friends, and I have to protect them. Trembling from head to toe, I pull out the 22, not really expecting to do much with it, but it's the only protection we have and it could at least buy us time. I take aim, but miss the first two times because the four-wheeler is just too bumpy. In seconds, that thing was going to be within arm's reach of us unless I did something. I jumped off the back, landing on two wobbly legs. I steadied myself as quick as possible. I aimed and fired. The only thing the creature does in response is lower itself to a stalking position. It looks like it's ready to pounce, but there's a dark liquid dripping from its melee that gleams in the moonlight. I raise the 22 again and squeeze the trigger. I repeat this until there's no kick anymore. When I open my eyes again, the thing's mouth is wide open and it's unscathed. I hear nothing for a few seconds, my eyes closed again. I can feel beads of sweat dripping down my nose, and my heart's pounding in such a way that it burns. I suddenly hear a loud screech, just like the ones this creature emitted before. Then everything goes silent, and I pass out. I wake up to Marley, who has dumped me in the bathtub at my grandparents' house. Her face is leaking mascara, she hugged me and kissed me and told me not to do anything like that ever again. It took me a long time to calm down and get out of shock. By the time her grandparents returned home, we were able to say that it was someone who broke in and that the missing ammunition was from us trying to scare them away. Later, alone, Marley told me that she came back to get me. She had grabbed a 12 gauge, praying that she could remember where she left me. Praying that I was still in one piece. This brings me to my least favorite part of the story, the part that really freaks me out. She says when she came to where I was, I was unconscious, back on the ground, and that wolf-like thing was standing over me, licking at my forehead. She said it was licking little dots of red, breaking my skin in some places due to its rough tongue, as soon as the headlights on the ATV hit it, the creature stopped tasting me and stared back at her. It snarled, backed into the woods, and disappeared. That creature could have ended me if that's what it wanted to do, but instead, it seemed to be savoring my still living body. I know I'll never go back into that part of the woods again. I'm not going to risk my life or hers for whatever reason. Late at night, from Kogi L. 
location, Franklin, Ohio. I had just quit my job. It was low pay and I was going to start a new one the week after that paid much more. My girlfriend and I were very excited, not only because of the pay, but also because we would be able to work together as she worked at the same job. This particular night, she didn't have to work, so we stayed up late watching movies and shows on the internet. It was about 2 a.m. when I realized that my girlfriend had fallen asleep. I always had a harder time going to sleep, so I turned off my phone and rolled over, cuddling my girlfriend and shutting my eyes. I laid there for a solid 10 minutes when I started to feel uneasy. Slowly, trying not to wake up my girlfriend, I looked over the room, just barely rolling over. I don't know why, but I felt like something bad was watching us. I immediately thought to myself that I was probably tired or even having a small panic attack. You see, I do have panic attacks at random times, and anyone with anxiety can tell you the feeling is like you're scared or just unsure of things. So I was thinking it was just a mini freakout. I rolled back over to hold my girlfriend again and tried to get some sleep. I closed my eyes and I could tell that I was finally beginning to drift off until I heard something. It sounded like something brushing against the top of my door frame. It was as if someone was standing there with a bristle brush and was rubbing it ever so slightly against the top of the door frame. Now to give you a rundown, my bed is long ways to my wall and right beside the door. I looked down at my phone to see the time, and it was about 2.48 a.m. I tried to tell myself that it was nothing, and I closed my eyes again. When I was closing my eyes, I could swear that something was right over me, looking down at me intently. I could literally feel myself starting to sweat as pictures of whatever it could be swept over my brain. I slowly opened my eyes just enough to look down toward the door. At first, I saw nothing but the dark hallway. Then, as my eyes adjusted, I could make out a figure. I definitely wasn't hallucinating. Whatever it was, it was disturbing to look at. It was all black with what appeared to be hair all over it. It had a long, thin neck, and the longer hair on it was on the back of the neck, kind of like how a horse's hair goes down the neck. Maybe it was a mane. Its head was the same thickness as its neck. It had hair-like bangs covering its face. I could not see its body, but I knew it must have been big enough to collide against the doorframe, and especially so if it had such a big neck and head. I stared at the thing in disbelief, shocked, wondering if I had lost my mind. Its neck stretched out the hair dangling down from its neck, and it turned my way. I stopped breathing immediately. I could barely see its eyes, but from what I could see, they were white with a black ring on the inside. Its neck continued to stretch out, moving up towards my face. I closed my eyes tightly and I started to pray. I then peeked through my eyelids and saw nothing. When I opened my eyes fully, I saw that the thing was gone. In that instant, I jumped up and turned on the lights fast. There was no sign of the thing. I ran to my son's room in a panic to check on him, but he was sleeping soundly. Still feeling terrified, I grabbed my son and laid him in bed with me and my girlfriend. A few days after that, I moved our bed to the other side of the room. I don't know what it was or what it wanted, but I want to be prepared if it comes back. Something tells me that I might be seeing it again. This final story is another great old story that was featured on this show back in November of 2017. It's been a while, so many of you probably haven't heard it but I know you'll enjoy it. This story is titled, If You Give a Lake Monster a Wallet, from Tofu, location, Wisconsin. 
As a lifeguard, I've been wanting to share my story, but I'm just now getting around to it. To start off, I'm a 17-year-old female lifeguard. I'm five foot seven at 115 pounds. I'm known to be creative and an out-of-the-box thinker, and I like to think I'm knowledgeable of the natural world, especially aquatic animals of all stripes. On the other hand, I'm an avid crypto enthusiast, indulging in anything that doesn't fit within nature's own rules. In addition, I found myself in numerous predicaments of doing dangerous things, almost all of which induced by morbid curiosity and a stubborn fearlessness. I worked at a Christian camp in Wisconsin during the summer of 2017. The camp was situated on a lakeside that you could see while driving past the campgrounds. The area we had to cover as a group was enormous in my opinion, especially because we were short-staffed and only had seven guards at most, which was a very rare occurrence. The lakefront not only included the swimming area, but a boating area as well. So if you go down the steep hill toward the lake, you would see two docks, one straight and one T-shaped, the first with five paddle boats and the second with six. To the left of all of that, past some willow trees, there dangled in the water a place where we anchored a water toy known as the blob. The blob is basically a huge inflatable tube, at least 12 meters long and two meters wide. One person would jump down on it, then would crawl to the end, and when positioned correctly, another person, usually bigger, would jump onto it, launching the other person in the air. Sometimes the kid wouldn't even get off the blob, while other times, like mine, the person gets launched up 25 feet in the air. The blob had to be anchored down elsewhere, so other lake goers would not use it while a lifeguard wasn't on duty. Obviously, it's a bit dangerous to catapult people if you do it wrong. The bob was usually heavy, very heavy. It would fill up with water, making it incredibly hard to drag the thing 200 meters or so to the blob tower, which is where the people would jump onto it from. And as a very strong swimmer and a point zero complainer, I usually had to get the blob with another coworker. Around 150 meters away from the blob's anchoring point, that's where the beach starts. Directly to the right of the beach is the Wibbit, or obstacle course. And next to that is a giant slide. It resides three meters in the deep water area. From the Wibbit to the Blob Tower dock, a shallow water line runs down to keep the shallow water swimmers in the shallow zone. All in all, the swim area is nearly 200 meters in length and 75 in width with the shallow line being at a decent 17-ish meters out. Now, every half hour we rotate, and we have a buddy check every 15 minutes. There are several stations we can be stationed at, and we regularly take over each other's stations. It was mid-July when I was positioned on a particularly cold and rainy day out on the big dock. I had my big lifeguard sweatshirt on, which had a big pocket in the front, I'd gotten some food on break, so my wallet was in there. Unfortunately, I'd forgotten I had it in there when I was ferried out to the raft, and when we had to call the kids onto land because of a quickly picking up storm, a coworker helped me back to shore on the kayak. I didn't realize until much later that I'd dropped my wallet in the water by the base of the big dock. There, the water was roughly 25 feet deep. The thought of diving down deep to find my wallet didn't faze me. I'd been trained in scuba diving before, and I'm a capable swimmer. Heck, even 30 feet would be easy for me. So on my future breaks, I used the extra time to scan the bottom of the lake, looking for my wallet. Now, there are a few things you should know about lake diving. One, it gets cold, and it gets cold fast. At the top of the water, it's around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, while 12 feet below, it's probably around 55 degrees, and it gets colder the deeper you go. It also gets dark fast. Fresh water isn't like clear salt water, and with kids kicking up sand and other debris under the water, it only makes the water cloudier. 
Luckily, diving down deep enough rendered the silt to not be as bad. However, you had to be careful as to not stir up the debris yourself. It's easy to kick up dust and leaves coating the bottom of the lake. Due to this, I couldn't use fins, nor could I push off the bottom when I needed to surface. Despite these challenges, I proceeded to free dive to search for my wallet, making four to seven dives per 30 minute period. All I had was my goggles and a swimsuit. I'd take a big breath, then dive down to search. Please keep in mind that you should never free dive without a buddy or training at the very least. It can be dangerous than actual scuba diving. It's something you don't want to do alone. The water was cold and the pressure harsh. I couldn't seem to get my ears to equalize. I normally had scuba gear on, so without it, the diving was limited. I could only go so deep. So each session, only the last two or so dives would be worth anything because it'd take that long to get used to the pressure. It was during this week of diving that something very unexpected happened. A good sized largemouth bass had floated into the swim area, absolutely torn up. Its innards were splayed and it had a huge tear or bite mark on its belly as if something took a big chomp out of it. The worst part was the thing was still alive. Luckily, it was a teen's camp and not a kid's camp, so the campers weren't too shaken. After we had our oohs and ahs, it was quickly forgotten about. But that wasn't the end of it. More fish kept turning up dead like that, and I'd heard from a coworker who lived on the lake that while they were out kayaking, they'd come across a large carp, a carp the size of a medium dog, mangled in the same horrific way. And I couldn't help but wonder, what in the world could be doing something like this? A fortnight after losing my wallet, I decided against my better judgment to dive down using the anchor line on the big dock. Basically, going hand over hand on the chain to pull myself down, all while spending as little energy and oxygen as possible, it'd be better than free diving and I'd probably find my wallet much faster. I let the anchor down and I took a series of heavy breaths, preparing myself for the descent. Then I began my climb. I got to maybe 20 feet down when I noticed something in the gloom below me. It was a large, darker mass slinking through the darkness in the water below. I could barely make out the silhouette, but it was there. It was enough to send shivers down my spine, shivers that weren't from the cold water. It was fish-like, but much too big and bulky for any native species around here. In fact, the only native fish to Wisconsin that could fit the silhouette's size was a sturgeon, but those are river-dwelling fish, not lake dwellers. In the murky waters, I quickly lost sight of its form. Not being able to tell where it was freaked me out enough that I booked it back up the line. I didn't speak a word about what I saw to my coworkers. Why? Well, I was already the weird kid. I was a nerd for too much scientific stuff for my own good, and they would just poke fun of me for it. And I knew I just wouldn't hear the end of it if I let them have it. So I just returned to diving the drop off slope with my imagination running wild every time I saw a flickering shadow cast underwater. The next week whilst doing a swim test, which required me and my coworkers to stand in the water to ensure nobody drowned and to assess their swimming abilities, I felt something at my feet in the chest high water. Nibbles and other movements startled me throughout the entire time causing me to yelp in surprise here and there. And yeah, I got plenty of odd looks. I joked with the kids and my coworkers about it, saying how a bluegill must have thought my legs looked good. That week passed by without incident, and to my surprise, I ended up finding my wallet on a dive. I couldn't have been happier about it. It wasn't until the second to last week there that I was horrified. Kids were running to my coworkers and I left and right, talking about something pecking and biting them while in deeper water and right next to the swim line. 
One kid even reported he felt something chasing him. We assured them it was probably a bluegill defending its nest, despite being well out of the spawning season. But there was one final thing that had me on the radio, calling down to the head guard. You see, one of the kids' swimsuits had been torn to shreds by something, starting at the seam of the bottom. A long and large piece of cloth had been ripped off and torn up. Luckily, the suit was double-layered, so only the outer layer was damaged. I asked the crying girl what happened, and she explained that her friends and herself were swimming over by the shallow swim line, when suddenly, she felt something tug on her swimsuit. I asked her if any of her friends were by her, and she responded with no. When I asked her where she'd been swimming, she pointed directly where I was standing a fortnight prior. To stop them from panicking, I told her that she might have just caught it on something, even though I knew damn well there were no debris in that area or vicinity. And then there came the last kid. His arm was bleeding something fierce. His forearm was covered in tooth-sized holes, hundreds of them, and they spanned a diameter of about 15 inches. The bite partially went up his bicep, and there were bleeding holes on the underside as well. The kid had to be calmed down, then was rushed to the hospital to receive nearly a hundred stitches. From the looks of it, the kid was lucky he didn't lose an arm. After talking to my coworkers at a sort of lifeguard dinner outing, one of the more serious coworkers of mine piped up about seeing something. He claimed to have seen huge fish when they were untangling the buoy lines that would attach to the blob. Others piped up about feeling something swimming by them on particularly hot days while they were sitting in the water at water toys. Another coworker confessed to seeing something by the blob whilst doing a body search, but didn't see anything. I mentioned my experience then, and despite all of this evidence, we never made a move against it to see what it was. Even after the guard season had ended, I still find myself thinking deeply about this incident. I don't know if what I saw was in fact a new species, which wouldn't be too big of a surprise as the lake housed rare freshwater jellyfish. Then again, considering the size of that bite mark, it may have been some sort of lake monster. Either way, I'm still highly curious about it, and I would like to take a dive there to see what I can find, despite the danger. Whether I like what I find, that'll be another story in the future, if I survive to tell that story. If you find yourself in one of the states in the Midwest United States, don't worry. The odds of you becoming chow for something strange and terrifying are pretty low. So go on, enjoy yourself, frolic through the fields, hunt down some deer, and just ignore those strange howls coming from the wood's edge. The people that do wind up as food are the ones that are a little too curious. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget, you can share your story with us at darknessprevails.org. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails, or you can browse our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails, or by clicking the shop button below if you're watching on YouTube. Now then, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about eight scary hunting stories. Mike Hint says, video idea, when cryptids attack. That's basically most of the stories I do, but it's a unique enough title that I would probably take that idea from you. Thank you. Jay Gona says, I like turtles. Jay, I think, I think we all like turtles, actually. If you don't like turtles, I think you might not be human. Bori Kua says, sweet freaky stuff. My undercarriage is itchy. Well, come on, give it a good scratch. Doesn't matter who sees. Real men go out of the way to scratch themselves in public. At least that's what my father said before he was arrested. Alexander Hamilton says, legit just finished up a day's hunt and this is what I come home to. Thanks, darkness. God, that sounds satisfying. If I wasn't such a boring person, I could do that too.
go out for a hike, come home to some hiking scary stories, and just have a great night. And Kieran Hall says, another graveyard shift with darkness. Going to be a good night. Hex yeah, just be sure to comment today so we know you're still alive and kicking. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. But don't you worry, more scary stories are on the way soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my incredible patrons who continue to donate. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one. <laughs>